Hello everybody and welcome to this afternoon's segment of Winter Tales. Um, just before we begin, I think I should probably remind you that we're not expecting a fire alarm, but if one does go off, please leave by the exits with, a, with the green markings um, and please keep your masks on at all times. Those are the, the kind of key things. I'm just delighted to see you and to welcome you here today for this uh, segment of the Winter Tales Book Festival. For the next hour, we're going to be discussing the life, legacy and work of George Mackay Brown, one of 20th century Scotland's finest uh, poets, writers of short stories, novelists, children's author, journalist, you name it. He, he does a bit of everything. Um, it's a wonderful time to be discussing George Mackay Brown because, of course, this year is his centenary year. It's 100 years since his birth on 17th of October, 1921. And of course, it's particularly nice to be talking about George Mackay Brown and the University of Edinburgh because he's an alumnus of this university. He came here in 1956 to study English literature and graduated in 1960. And he began but didn't finish postgraduate work on his hero, the poet Gerard Manley Hopkins. And I'm not sure if George Mackay Brown ever set foot in New College but in 1954, two years before he came to Edinburgh to study for his degree, he of course published his debut collection, The Storm and Other Poems. <coughs> and the very first poem of that collection declares Scotland to be the Knox ruined nation, that poet and saint must rebuild with their passion. So I'm not sure how he would have felt by, uh, about the stern and imposing statue of John Knox in our quadrangle. That might not have been the place for him, but maybe we can talk about that a bit later. My name is Lyndon Bickett and I'm a lecturer in literature and religion here in the School of Divinity and up until now a really large part of my work has focused on George Mackay Brown and his corpus and in particular what I like to think of as his Scottish Catholic imagination and in fact I published a book on that in 2017 and this year I'm very proud to be the co-editor of An Orkney Tapestry. Um, here it is first published in 1969. Um, this is a book that's long been out of print, but it's a really seminal book in George Mackay Brown's oeuvre, and it's been hugely influential in Scottish literature and has meant a great deal to many, many people. So um, I'm very happy to, to publish that. I'm also pleased to be joined today by two other ardent fans of George Mackay Brown and experts in his work, both of whom have recently published uh, publications uh, to celebrate the man and his writing on his centenary year. First of all, let me introduce to you Jerry Cambridge, who's first on my left, right in the centre here. Jerry is a poet, critic, essayist and editor with substantial interests in print design and typography, as well as a background in natural history photography. His most recent publications include Notes for Lighting a Fire, shortlisted for the Scottish Mortgage Investment Trust's Book of the Year Award 2013, Aves, uh, Prose Poems About Wild Birds, Madame Fifi's Farewell and Other Poems, and Nothing But Heather, Scottish Nature in Poems, Photographs and Prose. He founded the transatlantic poetry magazine The Dark Horse, which is still Scotland's leading poetry journal in 1995. And in fact, there is a centenary edition of The Dark Horse, which Jerry will now model for you, glamorous assistant Jerry, and he will be available after our discussion to, to sell you copies of that. And also, please let me welcome Maliki Talak here today. Maliki is the author of three books, most recently a novel, The Valley at the Centre of the World. He's also the editor of Simple Fire, which you might show. Thank you, Maliki, <laughs> which is the selected short stories of George Mackay Brown. Maliki is from Shetland and now lives in Dunblane. Um, and of course, the selected short stories of George Mackay Brown will be available to buy alongside an Orkney tapestry. We might even sign them um, after our discussion this afternoon. So welcome, both of you. I think how this is going to work is that we're just going to have a conversation really about George Mackay Brown and what he means to us and the impact of his writing. And I wonder if I could maybe start off by asking Jerry, how did you first encounter George Mackay Brown's work and did you get to know him and, and what was the impact of that on you? Um, I first encountered uh, George's work in uh, 19, about 1982, I think. Whenever I bought, uh, I was starting to 
become really interested in my early 20s in, in Scottish poetry. And uh, in the Third Eye Centre uh, in Glasgow, now the CCA, I, just, I came across an anthology called Seven Poets, um, which was illustrated by Sandy Moffat's famous, um, very male-centred painting on the front cover. And uh, George was one of the poets included. And that's where I first came across his work. Um, and in 1985, at the time, I was working as a freelance uh, journalist for Reader's Digest, mainly. And I did a travelogue on the Orkney Islands. And one of the reasons I wanted to do that was to meet George, because I'd uh, developed a real interest in his work. And uh, that's where I first met him, 1985. Uh, didn't particularly go well, I have to say, the very first meeting. In fact, if you bear with me, I'll read out a little bit of what he said to me. Um, it was hardly an auspicious first meeting. Alcohol narcotized any embarrassment I may have felt at the stilted conversation, with George looking pointedly at his watch and gazing around the room in the uncomfortable silences. I told him I'd met a local man and had a few drinks with him. Be careful around him, Jerry. Why, I said, is he violent in drink? Quite violent and also religious. He tries to convert you. And if that doesn't work, he hits you, punches you into the kingdom of heaven. Um, and thereafter, I, he agreed to meet me a couple of days later after that unfortunate initial experience. And uh, on that occasion, we... Um, we got on much better because I was sober. And uh, then we got slightly drunk together, which made a difference. Um, and thereafter, I just began corresponding with him. Uh, I wrote him a letter, um, enclosing a couple of poems when I went back to uh, Ayrshire, which was where I was living at the time. And he, to my surprise, sent them back with handwritten penciled comments. Um, there's a whole account of my, my uh, friendship and correspondence with George in, in the, the centenary issue of the magazine, so I, I don't want to repeat myself there. Thank you. Um, Malky, I wonder if you could tell us how you first encountered George's work. So, I read George first in school, um, and it was short stories, we read one or two of his short stories, probably it would have been about 1996, so the, the year that he died. Um, I was in high school then um, in Shetland. And I can remember the reading of the, the stories and I can remember them having no <laughs> discernible impact on me whatsoever. And I think to... <laughs> I think the reason for that was that at the time, like many young people, I suppose, I wanted to read about places further away. I wasn't, I wasn't so interested at all in writing from Shetland or from the Northern Isles. Um, and it was, his work felt too close to home, I think. And I didn't read him again until I was in my early 20s. And at that time, I had uh, been to university, and I was living in, in Prague. And I was feeling what I gradually re realized was homesickness. It, uh, it took me a long time, I think, to accept that um, I was feeling homesick for Shetland. I was even starting to think about going back, having always been certain that I would... Uh, never go back and live in Shetland. And somebody gave me a copy of For the Islands I Sing, uh, George Mackay Brown's memoir, which was a short memoir which was published just, just after his death. Um, and I read that, and then I immediately reread it again. And the book had an enormous impact on me 
in part, I think, because of when I read it, because I was at that time, I suppose, thinking a lot more about my relationship with home, with the islands, and here was somebody who was absolutely certain in his commitment to his home, to his place. And it felt to me something like permission, I think. Um, permission to long for this place that I thought I had left. Permission to go home, as I did shortly after that. And permission also to begin to think about place and my place and my home as subject matter in, in writing, because at, at that time I was also beginning to write um, poetry then, but beginning to, to think about um, longer pieces of work as well. And so reading that book and then going on to read more of the, the short stories um, and, and, and other prose, the, the novels as well, um, really did affect me deeply and um, pushed me towards writing about Shetland and writing about my own connection with, with place. I think I had quite a different experience to you, Maliki, when I first encountered George's work because I, I read it in an educational setting as well. I was at university in my very first year of studying Scottish literature in Glasgow and we were looking at the Scottish short story of the 20th century and of course we looked at people like Gail Kennedy and Alistair Gray and George Friel and it was all really inspiring stuff actually it kind of opened up worlds to me that I hadn't ever encountered before but we read this short story Andrina by George Mackay Brown and I was immediately enchanted by this short story it was the story it's a ghost story, first of all, and it's the story of an old retired sea captain called Captain Torvald, who's a kind of very gruff, masculine figure, and he kind of recurs, I think, quite often in George's body of work. There's a lots of hard-drinking sailors um, in his writing, and Torvald finds himself very unwell. He has the flu or something, um, and in fact, it sounds an awful lot like the recurrent tuberculosis that George Mackay Brown experienced himself. And in the midst of his illness, he is kind of ministered to by this young woman, Andrina. Um, there might be a sort of a bit of wish fulfillment there, I'm not sure. But Andrina visits Torvald and listens to his stories and hears him talk about his youth and some of the mistakes and regrets that he's made in the past. And it became clear to me in reading this short story that it was really a story of redemption and one of grace. And it really displayed the beauty of Mackay Brown's Catholic imagination. Um, it turns out in the end, and I hope this isn't too much of a spoiler, that Andrina, nobody else on the island has heard of her before, never mind has seen her before. And um, it turns out that she is the ghost of a, um, a grandchild of, of Torvald's, um, who's conceived in his youth, and he runs away as a young man because he's frightened um, and, and doesn't go to the University of Aberdeen as is expected of him, but um, goes off to the sea instead. Um, and this story is just scattered with stars, smattered with sea pinks, all those kind of material features of Orkney that crop up so often in Mackay Brown's work. And it has the most tender, gentle kind of reflection on human frailty. I don't see Mackay Brown ever really diagnosing sin as such, but just human weakness, which is something that is common to all of us and something understandable. And it just made such a huge impression on me. Um, and I wanted to read more and more of his work. And I remember phoning my dad and saying, Dad, I've read this amusing short story. It's by a writer called George Mackay Brown. He's from Orkney. You really need to give this a go. This is great stuff. And he said, Lyndon, we've been to Orkney on holiday. We've gone past his house. We've been telling you for years to read George Mackay Brown's work. But when you're a teenager, you don't really listen to your parents. Um, so that was kind of the start of it for me. And then after that, I kind of delved into the, the poetry and the novels and even the plays and, of course, the, the journalism and everything else that's in that rich body of work. But Orkney comes across so strongly, doesn't it? He's a real writer of place. Um, and I wonder, what is it about place that matters so much to George Mackay Brown? Jay? Um, well, I think I, I, he once said, I, I believe, 
uh, that if he'd been born in Birmingham, for example, he would never have become a writer, he didn't think. Yeah. That he needed the, the subject matter of Orkney. Um, and in a way, Orkney, sort of, you know, the, the Latin island ins insula is, is uh, you know, from which we get the English word insula, is Orkney is kind of, it's not insular, but it's protected by, by the sea to an extent. And he did once write in one of his poems, the ring of pure elements that is an island suffers a breach from the subtraction of sweet, bright dust about a wee girl leaving the island to go to Edinburgh and then coming back. And uh, that was a poem he didn't want me to reprint in my magazine when I asked him. And I often wondered why, but we can come, come to all that. But I think the, the, the fact that Orkney is, was a sort of bastion of, of uh, um, isolation in a way, sort of cultural isolation in one sense, mm -hmm. in terms of not, not being necessarily considered to be a part of the whole buzzing um, elements of Scottish literature as it may have been perceived to be at that point, which generally tended to be focused on Edinburgh. Yeah. Um, meant that uh, I often found when I went to see him that you had this sense that he was kind of sitting in this kind of uh, lofty space, observing everything from the from from a something of a height. It was kind of fascinating. It sort of gave him a perspective, I think, uh, as a writer from where in, in where he was. Um, and of course, people came to him. People came to George, really, didn't they? I mean, he didn't have to go anywhere. Some people like Robert Lowell, the great American poet, went to George. Robert Penn Warren, another American poet, went to George. <laughs> they visited him. Um, I was there one summer and he told me that this old man had come to visit him. I said, oh, who was that? He said, oh, Robert Penn Warren. <laughs> I said, Robert Penn Warren? <laughs> Kidding me Thank on. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> anyway, so yeah. that's, yeah. Malky, what do you think? Would you agree with that? And do you feel like, as a, an island writer yourself, that he looms large in the background? Is there a kind of anxiety of influence there? Yeah, I mean, definitely there are, I think there are a few writers who are so um, intimately and intricately tied with, with their own place, or with one place as, as he is. Um, and I think that that particular place obviously shaped to an enormous extent the way he wrote and what he wrote about, um, in part because by making this, dis well, whether he thought of it as a decision or not I'm, not, I'm not sure, but by geographically limiting his work in the way he did, I mean, he, he hardly ever wrote about anywhere apart from Orkney, it almost forced him to, for one thing, go backwards to write about Orkney as a place existing through time. Um, and it forced him to look, I think, for stories in, in different places, in different, in different ways, um, with different characters, perhaps, than other writers might have chosen. Now, it does, over his career, that there's you you start to see patterns of of repetition there are there are stories that that get repeated um in his work but it is astonishing that he was able to continue finding inspiration if if you like to use that word um just over and over again without having to look beyond Orkney and you know you mentioned about the cultural isolation but of course he was interested too in the ways that Orkney was not culturally isolated thinking back to um, uh, Viking times Norse times when when Orkney in fact was was a kind of cultural hub yeah. and he's often writing about sailors from other countries um, within Orkney so he was very aware of the movement of people within his place and the way that the place was enlarged by that. Um, but he, it, it's quite an incredible thing to, 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 to see this enormous body of work 
that is so geographically restricted. That's right. And I think he said he could have lived for another 100 years and still would have enough to talk mm -hmm. about. I think for me, place in his work is so intimately connected with time, isn't it? And it's, I think you've mentioned in the past, Malachi, that he doesn't really write historical fiction as such. He's interested in essence more than anything. Um, and what you find when um, you look at Mackay Brown's manuscripts, which nerdy people like I have, is that he often removes very concrete details and markers to specific points in time to make things more elusive, more timeless, um, and less, I suppose, less likely to date in future, um, you know? It, yeah, I mean, it's, it's fascinating when I was um, preparing to, to make this selection for the, the, the selected short stories and for which I read all of the books, in o the, all of the collections of short stories in order. It was incredible how often you would read page after page of a story and not be sure when it was set. Yeah. It could have been set in 1960, it could have been set in 1860, and there were, there were just not enough of those kind of markers that we expect mm -hmm. to, to place a story in time. Mm -hmm. There's a story, I think, is it in Sealskin? I think it's in Hawkfall, that collection. It's maybe the fourth or fifth collection that he writes of short fiction. And it's a rehearsal of Orkney's Selkie myth, so it's about seals coming to land and shedding their skin and becoming human beings. And um, it taps into the, the myth of the, the crofter who steals the seal skin and, and is, uh, has a beautiful otherworldly wife who searches everywhere for her seal skin and can't find it because it's hidden in a, a case or a chest or something in an attic. Um, and of course that all rehearses the Ballad of Sulskiri and, and other Selkie ballads from Orkney tradition. Um, but Mackay Brown's short story Sealskin is really timeless and very beautiful. There's not, there's not anything sentimental about it. It's a story of great poignancy. Um, it's very moving. But if you read that alongside another short story on a similar theme like um, Linklater's Sealskin Trousers, that's the story that's really dated because the language is a, so of the moment that Mackay Brown, without really using Orkney dialect very much or um, making other kind of using other devices, manages to make um, his work so timeless. And um, I think that's a real skill. I'd be interested to hear your thoughts, Jerry, about language. This is something we've kind of spoken about a bit before: is yeah. um, the fact that George did not write an Orkney dialect. You know, for most Shetland writers, the idea of not using dialect is almost <laughs> unthinkable. Yeah. Um, and, and yet, he, all, with very few exceptions, it's, um, the, the dialect is hardly there at all. And I, I wondered why he, why he did that. Um, I, I would say probably because he thought that he would reach a wider audience and possibly write better. In, in, in English. But there's markers yeah. of location, aren't there? There are, I mean, and, and it, it wasn't that he was, he certainly wasn't against uh, Scots, he was a great fan of MacDonald's mm -hmm. early lyrics, mm -hmm. and, uh, and there was um, Robert Lindell, who was yeah. the, who wrote some gorgeous wee Scots lyrics, like the Twa Kinsman, the winter lift as glint and doon, mm -hmm. with torment and stars besplint, as were the very heavens aboon, clean gait with frosty merriment, the lawanine of tack and tent, which heels like Mansi or the Boo, was days upon the land are spent, lugging with Taurus and the Plew. And he was a great fan of, of the likes of Robert Lindell and wrote a beautiful um, little memoir, in fact, in, in Lyndon's uh, edition of the Orkney Tapestry uh, about Robert Lindell. Very, very touching. Um, and it's fascinating just to see uh, um, Robert Lindell was included in. in um, Philip Larkin's famous 20th century uh, anthology of the Oxford Book of English Poetry, but George wasn't. Yeah. And uh, that's amazing. Isn't that fascinating. Absolutely. It was just just with one little poem, yeah. Robert Lendl. Yeah. But uh, George was George was entirely omitted. Uh, so it's interesting that I think he's uh, stylistically. I think he's he's. Um, it, you either take to what he's doing, or you mm. understand it, or you don't. And I I, I have a feeling if. Larkin had visited Orkney, which, as far as I know, he never did. He would have um, understood yes. 
we'd have got it. Aye. Aye, I know. Aye. I think, I mean, there's something so distinctive about George's voice, isn't there, in 20th century Scottish poetry, in 20th century British and poetry generally. Yeah. And um, it's hard to pinpoint. You've got those different stylistic elements in his work and it crosses over from poetry into prose. You can tell that when you read a, a short story or a novel of Mackay Brown's that this is a poet writing. Yeah. He's drawing on that kind of sparse, elusive, bare style of the Icelandic sagas. But there's also that kind of decorative, lush, rich element as well, isn't there? Do you have a kind of favourite mode in which he writes? Do you prefer poetry or prose? I suppose, Malachi, you have to say short stories because you're the editor of the selected <laughs> short stories. What do you think? I feel better equipped to judge prose yeah. than poetry. Um, and I've, I've read much more of the prose. Um, I, he's, he's very interesting in the way that he doesn't have one prose voice. He has several that he could have, kind of moves between and often within each story collection he will kind of drift in a, in a similar way between the, the really sparse um, pieces, which are often the ones about uh, the, the kind of Norse Viking stories where he will he will often use a kind of saga um, voice, which is really bare bones prose, um, and then the more contemporary pieces will often be much much richer um, and much closer, I suppose, to perhaps what some of his contemporaries were were writing. Do you think there's weakness in this, though? Because I think sometimes critics find him repetitive. That comes up a lot. He's criticised for looking back at the past very often. I think these are both unfair criticisms, but then, of course, I would say that because I'll defend George Mackay Brown <laughs> against pretty much every criticism, apart from maybe that he doesn't include women in a major way in, in, in many of his works, but not all. Yeah. Um, I think, for me, that repetition isn't a problem, particularly because he's always striving for clarity. You know, there's this real... Uh, quest for purity, for, for refining work. And actually, the, the idea of repetition is liturgical, isn't it, in the work? And it's about the turning of the seasons, and it's about the kind of harmonious wheel of the year, and about his Catholic worldview, which sees everything as very kind of um, holistic and part of one living yeah, and, uh, ecosystem. I mean, he was an obsessive redrafter, wasn't he? And I, I almost see some of this is a kind of redrafting through his career, trying to retell a story he had told before, but do it in a better way. Okay. And so we're kind of coming back to the same stories and the same themes, trying to um, do, it, do it better. Yeah. And, and uh, in terms of the distinctiveness of his writing, quite often that distinctiveness, uh, I think, comes through even just in, the, in his use of names. Yeah. Like Lonevald, and I know that some people that's that be pronounced wrong, but I quite like Lonevald because yeah. it sounds more north. It does have Lonevald who, and Ronald. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Ronald. I mean, why is it spelled like that then? Um, Lonevald who stalks then coughs with his stick. I do not love. Yeah. His dog has a loud, sharp mouth. The wood of his door is very hard, and so on. You know, and he's he's got the confidence to actually write in monosyllables. Mm -hmm. I mean. I'll read you a wee, um, it's a tiny wee extract, uh, which to me is very distinctive, and it's pure George uh, in one of his poems. It's from that sea village, Shetland, from uh, a sequence called Stations of the Cross. It's only one three-line stanza. There he rides now, look, the laird, a brace of grouse to the manse, one hand on the rein, long and white and scented. And no one else really writes like that. Um, 24 words, all of them monosyllables, apart from the last Latinate, centred. And most poets now wouldn't have the confidence, really. Or not necessarily the confidence, but they t would tend not to write, but, you know, decide that they were going to write mainly in monosyllables. Mm -hmm. um, but you have a sense whenever George does it that he's completely aware of what he's doing in terms of the texture of his language. And he can contrast that with all, like the, the little poem I quoted from before, Trees That I Wanted to Reprint, um, begins, uh, a certain girl is out of the islands, she with spillings of sunlight, hair. 
and sunlight hair, not sunlit hair, mm. but sunlight hair. And it's very distinctively chosen and very carefully chosen. Uh, mm. And he once compared this, uh, uh, he once talked about his own writing process, I think, as being a bit like the speech of islanders on some of the smaller islands in Orkney. Um, the, the world is placed carefully like stones in a dry stained dike in a sentence. A perfect description. Yeah. yeah. I wonder if we can turn to the subject of his spirituality and his religiosity and how that informs his work. Because I guess um, when I mention criticisms, it, that comes up as well as being <laughs> something that affects the quality of the writing because of his obsessive editing and revisions. And we know that he was perhaps over scrupulous about. Um, some of the work that was in print. Um, he often went back over poetry and messed around with it, really, to use a technical term, so that poems that had appeared at the beginning of his career in certain collections would then be included in uh, selected poems, volumes, and um, he would have messed around with them and tinkered and actually made them much less potent, much less powerful as a result um, in that quest for latterly not offending people, I think. There was a real... Um, obsessive need to leave a legacy that was um, spotless, that wouldn't be offensive. And so even very mild references in the work are changed and not for the good. So one of the most famous examples is in the poem Ham Novel, where a, a stallion is later changed to cart horse. <laughs> you know, so you can't even have a stallion in that poem. And lovers unblessed by steeples lay under the buttered bannock of the moon appear in the original poem. They later become ploughboy and milk, plow, ploughboy and milk glass tarry under the buttered bannock of the moon, which is a, a terrible change. Um, I think they become these sentimental rustics, don't they, rather than these lovers unblessed by steeples. Um, is that really to do with his religious perspective, or what do you think? How does that inform his work? Well, it's. I mean, this is, this is not a, a side of his work that I know a huge am amount about, but it was, it was very interesting to read the, the short story collections in order and to see religion creep in, in in different ways gradually as he went along. There's an increasing number of nativity yeah. stories and Christmas stories started to appear, particularly towards the end of his career. That's right. Um, so it, it obviously became more a part of his thinking and writing as as he got older. Yeah. And as, as well as not wanting to offend others, I wonder if it was also to do with his own increasing sense of scruple, which mm -hmm. is, in, in, in one sense, it's understandable because, you know, many of us, um, many, many poets, I think, uh, myself included, look back at some things that they may have committed to print or committed in print um, <laughs> earlier on and think, oh my God, how did I do that? And yeah. I seem to have got away with it, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think in George's case, because he, he had various editions of his work, he did have a chance yes. to rework things. Um, and quite often, but, but he also really omitted in a quite bizarre way, some outstanding pieces of his mm. Um, pieces which are not, wouldn't, wouldn't really come across as having anything particularly dubious about them, apart from maybe the fact that there's a, there's a poem, the poem that opens The Year of the Whale, I think is 1965 Hi. collection. Yeah. Um, it's called The Funeral of Ali Flett. Mm -hmm. And Ali Flett is a, is a fisherman, but he's obviously a pagan, basically. Mm -hmm. He's completely pagan, and he's not a believer as such. And the poem deflects that. And it's probably one of George's finest poems, I would say. Um, but he left it out of all subsequent collections. Uh, I think which is, it's in his. It's in his. Um, it's in this one. It's in his selected poems of. Uh, was that 1967? Oh, I can't remember, but I think so. Yeah. It was in the select. This selected poems, but I don't think it was any others after that. And you think, you know, yeah. that's. Uh, it's, it's a peculiar act of self-sabotage, in a way, for the poet to leave out the, what, what may be considered their best work. Um, but it, interestingly, although he didn't always make the best decisions about his previous work, he didn't 
I don't think that he necessarily became a weaker writer. As he, yeah. he, he, some of the, the, the new writing that he produced later in his life was some of his best writing. I mean, among the short stories, one of my um, very favorites, uh, very favorite pieces is, is one called Dancy, which is from the last collection, um, which is not only a, a brilliant, fascinating, um, compelling story, it is also incredibly one of the only, if perhaps the only one of his short stories that had that has a kind of yeah. complex female central character in it. And it's, it's kind of midrashic, that short story. It's really interesting because Dancy is a kind of version of Ruth uh, from the Bible. She gleans in the field with the other men. Um, and she's also a reflection of Archie Angel, the child who is um, reported to have been washed ashore with the, the wreck of the Archangel in Orkney. So she's a character who taps into Orkney's local legend and history, but she also has a kind of really firm biblical basis. So she's a wonderful short story. It's one but, of my favourites too. Yeah, and at a time when he was sometimes l leaning a bit toward too much towards sentimentality, it's actually a really complex... Um, th the characters are not very nice to yeah, each other darkness. and you don't quite understand why they're not being nice to each yeah. other and there were the choices he could have made to make it a nicer cleaner story and he didn't and i and yeah. i love that Absolutely. about it do we know but um when that story was actually written that's the thing because sometimes i think you know chronologically because for example a poet like robert frost um publishes one of his Finest poems called Delective and more or less his last collection. Everyone thinks that that's Robert Frost wrote that right at the end of his life, but maybe he didn't. Maybe, yes. maybe he wrote it. He, he might have written mm, that. Yeah. Well, it was well, a was winter it? short story and he wrote yeah. those every year for the Scotsman, so it might have been that it was written decades before it was collected in Winter Tales, the short story collection, which, by the way, I suggested as the title of this uh, festival. So it's not Shakespearean after all, it's George Mackay Brown, by the way. <laughs> I wonder if I could read a little bit of an Orkney tapestry. This might be a, quite a good time for it because um, this is just a very short section which is prose but it ends with a, a poem and it's a poem that he revised later on. And the, it begins with his, his favourite um, villain or uh, bete noir, Progress. And so he's writing about the valley of Ratwick on the island of Hoy. Time and chance happen to the valley. Changes came in the way of progress that were considered to be good. A new local newspaper, the Orcadian, came, a single copy, and was passed from croft to croft. A young voice read it aloud while everybody sat around the open peat fire. Subtly, the notion of progress insinuated itself. This reading of newsprint was thought to be a great advance on the chanting of old winter stories. The iron cruisy lamp, fed with fish oil, a dried wreath, reed pith for wick, went down before the paraffin lamp. It was more convenient to cook on a black enchantress range than over the open hearth fire that never went out from generation to generation. Loaves from the bakehouses of Hamnival gradually ousted oatcake and beer bannock. To begin with, a slice of white bread was lingered over like cake. And on Sunday mornings, as a special treat, they had tea instead of milk and ale. A school was built under Murphy under the Scottish Education Act of 1872. A new wooden shop sold paraffin, tea, biscuits, flour, boots, sweets, twine, sugar. The fishermen gazed in wonderment for the first time on oranges and apples. It is likely that some of the older men resented such novelty. And then there's a wee bit of verse. No red orchards here, the sea throbbing, cold root to salt incessant blossoming burdens the net with grey and white and with blue fruit. One man, the beachcomber, went his teetering way among the rocks after a storm, profiting from the uneasy truce of sea and shore. The valley got its name from the wreckage the beachcomber trafficked in. In this mystical realm where the giving of names seals a place with its destiny, he was the lord of the valley, the original inhabitant, and perhaps the last. And then we have a poem. Monday I found a boot. Rust and salt leather, I gave it back to the sea to dance in. Tuesday, a spar of timber worth 30 bob. Next winter, it will be a chair, a coffin, a bed. Wednesday, I tangled with Ike the Tinker for a can of Swedish spirit. Then we got drunk together behind the rock. 
Thursday, I got nothing. Seaweed, a whalebone, wet feet, and a loud cough. Friday, I held a seaman's skull, sand spilling from it the way time is told on kirkyard stones. Saturday, a barrel of sodden oranges. A Spanish ship was wrecked last month at the Cane. Sunday, for fear of the elders, I sit on my bum. What's heaven? A sea chest with a thousand gold coins. I absolutely love this short story, and I've actually written about it for Jenny's um, centenary issue of The Dark Horse. But it's so comic, it's so affectionate, and you can really get a sense of the personality of the beachcomber, this kind of ragged man scavenging the shore, can't you, for things that he might sell later. But he's turned into the kind of noble prince of Denmark as he hands that, holds that skull aloft. And this is a poem that was changed over decades because Mackay Brown just couldn't resist doing things to it. So um, later on, uh, there's no getting drunk with Ike the Tinker behind a rock. Instead, the shore is uh, cold with mermaids and angels. So there's a kind of poetic vision of drunkenness instead of a fight over a can of booze. That's amazing, isn't it? How it's, things it's, change. Yes, and Lind Lyndon, as you've mentioned, has got an absolutely wonderful uh, essay which charts all the different um, subtle but, but very significant textual changes in that poem which is, I believe, as you said in it, one of his, uh, probably his most popular poem, Beachcoma. Yeah. And it's the, it uses the, the, a structuring device of the days of the week, um, and they, which, which I think George got from a poem called, uh, by Thomas Hardy, which also does the same, um, except for a very different purpose. I think Hardy was really important to him, actually, and it's not, Hardy isn't somebody that's written about in connection with his work very much, but... Yeah. I think him and Dylan Thomas, even though he denies that um, under Milkwood was the uh, the basis for things like Handevo and for Greenvo, that wonderful first novel, yeah. there's definitely textures of Dylan Thomas there, I think. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. But, uh... I, um, if you could recommend just one text from Mackay Brown's whole body of work for people to read, what do you think it would be and why? And just to give you a really easy question, shall I start? Just to give you a bit of time to think. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> I can go first if you like, just to... Go on, you ah, go okay. first then. Not to take over too much after just reading something from an Orkney tapestry. Well, I mentioned Andrina. That's the short story that first made mm. such a huge impression in me. And actually, I think that the short stories are probably my favourite work. I think that's probably what he does best for me, is the strongest... However, I think Magnus from 1973, that novel about Orkney's patron saint, is just an absolute masterpiece. And I think that that was the work of which he was most proud. It's a really strange and at times probably a slightly inaccessible novel. Not much is written about 12th century Norse saints in fiction these days. But it is just his uh, masterpiece. I think it's full of devotional, I suppose, wonder at this historical figure who is, for him, a real flesh and blood man. And um, I think Magnus was the sort of still centre of his religiosity, of his spiritual life. Um, and this novel, rather be than being a novel about religion, is really a religious novel. Um, and it's also deeply experimental and really weird in places. I think you don't actually get to see the execution of Magnus by axe stroke on Easter Monday on the island of Eglesey. But the the perspective shifts so that you have a chapter which is all of a sudden set in a concentration camp in Germany in the Second World War. Um, and of course, Mackay Brown is making this wider point about sanctity being something that lasts forever. And Magnus's original sacrifice sets the machinery of God's grace in action and um, his, his sacrifice is repeated again and again over, over time. But I've talked too much. What would you recommend, both of you? I really like Beside the Ocean of Time, I, I, which was his final novel and is, I mean, it's almost like a young adult novel in, in some ways. It's quite, it's very, it, the, the central character is a, is a young boy and it's quite um, childlike and it's telling in, in some ways, but you, you really get a sense of uh, George Mackay Brown's understanding of place through time, as, as Orkney as a community that exists through time in that book, I think. The kind of jumping from, from, from time to time that happens. And I'm a wee boy at the centre of 
the bookstore in Ragnar's son, you know, he's a bit of a George Mackay Brown figure himself because he's a dreamy wee boy, you know, <laughs> and he doesn't really like school and he's, he, he finds that he's the best at writing compositions. He becomes a writer when he's older. Mm-hmm. It's a fascinating book and it riffs on lots of previous work, of course, as well. It draws together threads of different earlier things. And I find it incredible that it was shortlisted for the, for the Booker Prize. You can't really imagine a book like that being shortlisted for the for the prize these days. I think he uh, was delighted when James Kelman won yeah, and he didn't. Sure. <laughs> Jerry, it's what a, about you? It, it's, um, it's probably quite similar to there's a, there's a, a book by the, the Icelandic novelist Haldor Laxness mm-hmm. called Wild Light which was originally published as a trilogy mm-hmm. um, which I read by accident actually uh, uh, just I just discovered it in a in a library and it and the first First book in the trilogy, it was all published in a single volume by Harper Collins, I think, it was called uh, the, Rev- the Revelation of the Deity. And it just piqued my interest. And I wonder if George had read Lax, he must have read Laxness, Surely. probably, because that the character in Wildlight is also a, he's, his great ambition is to grow up to be a young, to be a great poet, yeah. Iceland's great poet. But um, in terms of, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm, Kind of inclined to the to the poems to some degree, um, but I I'm very very fond of the short stories as well, and it's very difficult to choose to choose any particular one. I think mm-hmm. uh, maybe um, I remember reading Celia for the first time. It's a great short story. Um, and uh, I've got a soft spot for 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 some of his. Um, saga-like stories, just for the sort of bare minimalism, mm-hmm. which is extraordinary. Um, uh, there's one called the story of Jorkel Hayfox, mm-hmm. which is uh, a, a Viking, a Viking story, and it's just the bareness of it is is a form of genius because it's so bold in its bareness. Um, and you just think no one else at all would write like this. And there's another one which was written for you might know. I can't remember the title. There's another one which was written for the um, maybe the centenary of Neil Gunn, mm. and is it? It's about it's about a, and it describes a really brutal um, uh, torching of a house. Yes, uh, I can't remember the name of it either. Yeah, it's a, and it's not a particularly long story, it's but it's fire in the title, uh, maybe. Yeah, and it takes place um, it takes place at Yule, and it's and at the end of it, the 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 old Bard in the in the who is in the the house before they put it to flame is allowed to walk out, mm-hmm. and he walks out and he, he totters off into the into the into the starlit snowy darkness, beyond the lessening circles of flame, and that's the that's yeah. the that's the line that I remember at the, at the end of it. I remember reading that and thinking, it's kind of extraordinary, um, because partly because it's so poetic, but what it's describing is brutal. Mm-hmm. You know, because yeah. basically it's describing the incineration of a of a of a of a house full of of uh, yeah. people. It's drawing from Nile Saga as well, I suppose, isn't it? And is it Christmas fires or Yule fire, something like it that? It might be, yes. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's fascinating in in terms of the the bareness um, in for the islands I sing. The connection that he draws is to Ernest Hemingway, yeah. who is a writer that you would never think of together with George Mackay Brown at all and yet of, of course in that kind of starkness of language he, he, he kind of wonders to himself in the book whether Hemingway had read the sagas yeah. Yeah. Um, and so there is that funny stylistic connection between these two writers who otherwise could, could hardly be more different That's right. yeah. I wonder Maliki if you would want to read something as well well I was just looking at the time and wondering yeah. whether we have to uh, invite questions well, from I the know. audience <laughs> rather than me reading something. I can't keep everybody here for hours and hours despite wanting to. Okay, well, maybe you can recommend the, the short stories. And I was going to read the, the last story in the yeah. book, Shell's story, in part because it's uh, uh, the only story that I could read the whole thing. It's just <laughs> about five minutes. Mm. Um, and it's there's a tiny bit of sentimentality in there, but it's a, <laughs> it's okay. a really lovely, um, short piece, just a really beautiful story, I think. But I think we probably should invite 
a few questions but, um, before the end. Good idea. Okay, well, I wonder, we've got a roving mic, so if anybody would like to ask a question, then please raise your hand and we'll be able to uh, take it. So, any questions? Oh, here's one. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, here's a question. Oh, story. Okay. I'm not going to get out of it then. That's right. <laughs> okay. So this is the last story in the in the collection, it, and it comes from his his last uh, his last collection. It's called Shell Story. The seagulls came to the island pier. The old wives came out with bowls with crusts and bits of fat in them. They threw the scraps to the gulls. While the food still hung in the blue air, the gulls gob gobbled every fragment up. That's Tommy Rich, that gull. That's my Tommy, said one old woman, pointing to a gull that was stretching his wings on the pier. Tommy got his death off Yesnaby 31 years ago come June. Here you come again, Willie Anderson, said another wife. Look at him gobbling up that hen giblet. He was always hungry when he came in from the sea. My neighbour Willie, he was lost on the trawler Nevis a long while ago. I think that gull is my brother Drew, said one old woman. But I was only two when his ship went down off Iceland, so I don't remember him. I can't tell if it's Drew or not. So the old wives spoke to the gulls after every dinner time, calling them by the names of drowned fishermen and sailors that were kin or acquaintances. One old wife, Charlotte, looked every afternoon into the gull-shrieking, gull-beating air over the village, and every afternoon she shook her head. She could never see her man, Jock Wiley, in the white, screaming gull drift. Jock Wiley had gone down in unknown seas the winter after they were married. Still, Charlotte threw bits of bannock and bits of bacon to the gulls, and Charlotte was getting on for a hundred years old. Still, the village wives kept up their sing-song. Here's a piece of bread for you, Bertie Ness. You like chicken wings, don't you, Ali Flett? Take it. I swear, Jerry Thompson, you're a greedier gull than you were a ferryman. I bet you'd sooner have beer than this end of bacon, Dickie Falster. Old Charlotte threw her scraps to the gulls and viewed every one from her shaded eyes and shook her head and went home. One day, there was such a storm that even the gulls kept to their crag ledges in the black craig. Oh, it was a howling gale out of the east. The fishermen and their wives and children stayed inside behind their rattling doors. They saw through their salt-crusted windows a woman struggling down to the pier. They thought every moment she would be blown into the white-crested waves. And it's Charlotte, they cried, in croft after croft. Then the village folk saw that a solitary bird had fallen and furled on the very edge of the stone pier. Old Charlotte took a piece of fine cake that she had kept from the last island wedding, full of fruit and nuts, fine flour and rum, and she put it into the seabird's beak. It seemed to be a bigger bird than the usual gull. The bird ate the bride cake and it flew three times round Charlotte's head, and then it swung away out to the open sea, and the wind blew salt spray over the roofs. The old woman knocked at every door along the village street. When the man of the house tugged the door open, so fierce the gale blew, Charlotte said in a young, sweet voice, Jock, my man, He's come back to see me at last from the wastes of ocean. Thank you. So I think we might leave it there. Maybe one final question for me just, just before we go. And I wanted to ask both of you, why are we still talking about George Mackay Brown's work a hundred years from his life? What's his contribution? What makes him so special for you? 
Um, I suppose, uh, stylistically, I'm sorry to talk about style, but poets are obsessed with style. Um, poetic style. Stylistically, he was, um, he was quite masterful in what he was doing. At, at one level, he was very much a conscious artist. Um, and as, as well as being an influence on um, the people who never met him, for the people who did meet him, um, his example was was uh, was extraordinary. Uh, just that the 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 dedication of the conscious artist, I think, is something that sticks with with a lot of uh, people. But also, the work is so distinctive mm -hmm. that it it sticks out. It just it just stands out really. But this is also true of, of numerous other poets in Scotland of that period, uh, like uh, Ian Clayton Smith. Norman McKeague, McDermott, et cetera, et cetera, all these, all these poets, their work is very singular, I think, in a way that um, maybe time just hasn't sifted through things yet in terms of the contemporary poets now writing. But uh, I wonder if, if our work as we write it is quite as singular as, as, as the work of those poets. Uh, I think that the distinctiveness is is key. I mean, you can you can read a George Mackay Brown story and you would never mistake it for, for anybody else at all, and that's part of what helps work to survive, I suppose. But there is also that huge appeal of, of an artist, of a writer, who who has that incredible connection, fidelity, love of place and who sees his work as putting that place into words i think that's still hugely appealing for people and and for people even people who have never been to that place um, and who may never go there to be able to explore it and to get to know it um, to get to know that community in words is is an amazing thing I think you're, I agree with both of you and I think all I would add is that for me now as it was the first time that I ever encountered Mackay Brown's work what stays with me is his huge tenderness and com compassion for human beings for the human person and all their complexity and all their weakness and frailty he looks at human beings with such a tender and compassionate eye and, and he is just a great chronicler of human life from childhood all the way up until old age I think um, and I don't think I'll ever stop reading his work it'll inspire me I think over time um, thank you so much both Maliki Talek and Jerry Cambridge for being here with me to talk about George Mackay Brown today and thank you George Mackay Brown 100 years from your birth for all your great work can and I, thank you to you can I do a wee quick sales pitch yes, yes. can I just um, do a wee quick sales pitch for this I've got um, Four copies of it, if anyone would like one. It's ten pounds, it and it's it. it's full of uh, anecdotal essays, accounts about the man's work, and uh, twelve pages of colour with manuscripts and letters and you name it. So, anyway, we'll be selling them afterwards and signing yeah. uh, books and things as well. Thank you. Thank you.